In business today, three things to know. First, Janet Yellen and the Fed make a deal on the economy. Low interest rates and easy money are here for now. But some argue inflation may be lurking behind the door they choose. Is it behind door number one or door number two or door number three? Or not at all. What happens if interest rates rise unexpectedly? Then, Rogue CEO, the firing of the founder of American Apparel is leading to questions as to what companies can do about a CEO who behaves badly, even as they help the bottom line. And in the corner office, a business gone to the dogs. How training Fido is making some rich. Arise Exchange starts now. It is Friday, everyone. I'm Andrew Schmertz. The markets continue to edge higher another record day, despite some unease that investors have priced stocks based on a trifecta of perfection. Low interest rates, low inflation, and a stable geopolitical environment. But some economists are now asking, what exactly are they looking at? And that there could be a risk of an unexpected interest rate and inflation blow up that could shock the markets. Hasn't happened yet. We'll get some thoughts in a moment as to whether there is going to be a summer surprise in store at all. But first, let's take a look at the numbers on Wall Street. As I mentioned, another record for the Dow Jones Industrial Average as it's edging closer to 17,000, up 28.46. The S&P 500, that's a record, up three and change to 1962.90. And the Nasdaq up 871 to 43.6804. Some of the top stocks we're watching today, activist investor Carl Icahn asking family dollar stores to put itself up for sale immediately and threatened to replace the entire board if that request was not met. Icahn became Family Dollar's largest shareholder earlier this month. Family Dollar up nearly a percent to 68.76. Starbucks says it is raising the price of certain drinks starting next week and the price of Starbucks packaged coffee in supermarkets will go up about a dollar. Company spokesman says the increase in price is not related to its educational assistance program, which was announced earlier this week. Starbucks down 63 cents. And medical device maker Medtronic says company data was compromised in its diabetes business unit because of a breach last year. The company released the details in a filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission on Friday. Medtronic's closing down 81 cents. And commodities, gold up $1.20 and oil up to $107.26 a barrel. To wrap up the week on Wall Street is John Manley, Chief Equity Strategist at Wells Fargo Funds Management. John, welcome back to Arise Exchange. Thank you, Andy. Uh, so what do you think of all these sort of anti-Fedsters out there, if we want to call them that, who are saying the Fed now has it all wrong? The Fed gets it right most of the time, and I've always worked with the notion that the chairperson of the Federal Reserve is at least as smart as I am. Uh, they see an awful lot more. They're, you know, Janet Yellen is a very experienced, very canny professional, and I think they're getting it. I think they're getting it right. I think that basically the U.S. needed stimulus. It needs less stimulus now. Things are working. Uh, it, there is concern, though, that she has no real other choice but to continue to follow this pattern to keep interest rates low and to keep cutting back the stimulus plan because they've sort of put themselves in that box. Is, is that true or do they have the wherewithal that if they have to make a quick pivot, they would? I think they're in the box because they want to be in the box. And I that's the they, right box to I, be in. I think so. I mean, I, I, I think the U.S. economy was in real bad shape a few years ago. Most of my friends either were losing their jobs or yeah. in fear of losing them. People are hiring again. Things are starting to work again. You know, uh, my father-in-law is a retired physician. He said when you get someone in the emergency room, the first thing to do, keep them alive. Dead patients don't get better. And that's exactly what the Fed had to do. And now where they are, there is this talk that the stimulus money just helped the, the stock market. It created an asset bubble and it's like uh, it appears there's a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking going on because a lot of people get to go on television and talk about that. Yeah, I, I, yeah it drives, I, I must say I, I'm losing patience with this stuff because it, it helped us all. I mean, yes, it helped some people more than others, but it helped people who own homes. It helped people who wanted to buy cars. It helped people who were looking for a job. I mean, th those don't sound like the 1% to me. Uh, I think it was a generally good thing for the economy and any time the economy benefits, some will benefit more than others. But I think on balance, the 
economy is better for what the Fed has done. And as far as inflation goes out there, they look at the CPI and the core numbers. Uh, it, that's not the real inflation that people feel. But the, mm -hmm. the question is, is how important is sort of the real inflation that you and I feel compared to the government data in their decision-making process when it comes to interest rates? Well, part of it's technology. I'm not buying a new computer every day. So, that, I mean, I, that, that sort of skews the number. I think there is strain. I think there is some strain in what I'd call the upper middle class uh, CPI. But I think the CPI is the CPI is the CPI. And whether it's right or wrong, I don't think it's any more wrong than it's ever been. And there's no real sign yet that the Fed has even reached the level they want to reach. And the equity markets and the bond markets pretty much pricing in no change to interest rates for the rest of the year, would you say? I think so. I, and I don't see why they should change. I, mean, I really don't see an uptick in inflation. I think people are looking around and worrying because they're not worrying. You know, the sun does shine sometimes. Things are pretty good. And when they aren't that good, I'll change my mind. But so far, all these doomsayers have just been not only premature. They've been wrong, right? They've been wrong. It's a very nice way of putting it. They've been wrong. <laughs> they've been, they've been, they've it's a good wrong. word. Mm -hmm. uh, and so so you think that Janet Yellen, the Fed's going to hold a hold of rates. Then what happens for the equity markets? We could have a correction at any time, though. At any time. You know, but, but I, I tell people, if I ever called a 5% correction in my career it was by mistake. These things come and go. How many have we had in, in the last If everybody years, called a correction at the same time, then there wouldn't be a correction because you, everybody would be making money. Now you're playing with my mind on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> but the, 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 the point of it is there, there's been how many four to seven percent corrections over the course of the last yeah. two years and the market's up over 40 percent. Which was the better call? Which was the more important call to make? We're always going to have corrections. They can happen at any time. But that's like saying it co could go up or could go down and I'll pick down because I don't have anything better to do. And generally when you look at consumer confidence out there, the Fed sees better confidence, better, better uh, jobs, but still no wage pressure. Right. And I think it's going to be a while before there is wage pressure. There still is a lot of innovation in the economy. I think eventually all this technology that corporations have applied to make themselves more productive gets arbitraged away. You and I live better because of what our grandparents had to put up with Rockefeller and Carnegie when they were putting together their empires. We live better because our grandparents sacrificed and mm -hmm. those people created infrastructure that we now take advantage of. Same thing's happening down the road. And so the takeaway here is that the inflation sort of alarmists out there right now appear to be long. You know, I've been around for a while. I've never seen it turn on a dime. I've never seen this go from fears of deflation to real inflation. I've seen the fears turn quickly, but I've never seen the actuality. Okay. John Manley, thank you so much. Have a good weekend. Thank you, Andrew. This week, American Apparel fired its CEO and founder, Dove Charney. He wasn't fired because the company was performing badly. Quite the contra contrary, American Apparel has turned things around. He was booted, apparently, because he has a history of alleged sexual harassment and some Rather bizarre behavior among his accusations, this video of him dancing naked in front of two female colleagues, stories of him engaging in lewd sexual acts during interviews with reporters and sexual harassment lawsuits. What does a company do when its founder, major stockholder and leader goes out of control? Eric Yo Kumstaller is founder and CEO of Vivaldi Partners, with, which is a global strategy consulting firm, and he joins us now. Uh, Eric, you know, sometimes the founder of a company is not necessarily the best CEO. Founders are entrepreneurs. They're sometimes a little bit out there, if you will. Uh, yet then they're asked to kind of fit into a special corporate mode, aren't they? That's right. Uh, it's a tough role because uh, uh, the very same trait that uh, allows the CEO to, f to, uh, to start a company, to found a company, to, to uh, uh, sort of is uh, oftentimes sort of a, a limitation as, it, as the company grows to the size of American Apparel, for example. Uh, none of these accusations against uh, Charney in this case were relatively new. What do you think pushed the board, which I suspect he handpicked, he controls 27 percent of the voting equity, uh, to fire him? I think that uh, there is more to the story. We don't really know exactly what happens, but uh, uh, unlike what you said earlier, the, the company is doing extremely badly. The top line growth hasn't done oh. as, it, as it wanted to, uh, should have done. The, the, the stock is at a dollar still uh, from $15. That's a 95% drop. I would think that it was about time that this is happening. Okay, so thank you for the correction there, because there were earlier comments and reports that he, in fact, was credited with turning around the company. But you think that this may, in fact, be more of a financial issue because the company has performing well, which I will turn around and then say, if the company was, in fact, performing better, do you think that they would have tolerated this longer? No, I don't think that this company should have even tolerated this long. In this day and age, you can't have CEOs mm -hmm. of that kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, permission uh, uh, really, uh, really be on the top anymore. So from a crisis management standpoint, then, did American Peril simply wait too long? And what does it do now to say, one, 
uh, Charney wasn't the key role, the key person in the company to run it, and that they can move forward. Uh, number one, on, 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 on Charney's uh, tenure, there is a, a, a significant drop. So there is a lot that he has uh, to bear with. But there is a turnaround, as you said, and that's true. They need to identify who, they, who is responsible for the turnaround. If this is part of the next level of leadership team, no company is run by a single person, not even at, uh, uh, at American Apparel. So they need to identify the next level of leadership and then to carry on that, uh, that, uh, um, uh, that, that, uh, that journey on one side. And on the other side, they need to fix the brand. It's kind Kind of schizophrenic, in my opinion. Yeah, well, and retailers are certainly having a difficult time. What happens if Charney sort of tries to make a comeback here? He does own 27% of the stock, and he may challenge this. What then does the company do, and how worried are you if you're going to be a shareholder for those still holding shares at a dollar a share? Yeah, he's not coming back. Uh, this <laughs> is not happening. This is just impossible for, for the legacy that co the company had. He has been a reputational risk for the company from almost, uh, for almost 10 years now. So this is, this is uh, a, a, a decision long overdue, and I don't think that there's a way back. What about other, other CEOs out there that are under pressure, uh, especially in the retail sector, in the clothing retail sector? Uh, should they now be on notice that even if they are the founder of the company, that they can get the boot here if they don't behave a little bit better? Absolutely. I think that this is really where we are. We are in a different time. There's a, there a very, very fine line between uh, competence and leading the company in arrogance, where arrogance and success grows up to you, grows to you so much into your head that you sort of like uh, stop thinking and well, well, acting wrongly. You, you, know, you consult with companies then. Uh, what do you kind of say to a company and maybe a board member that comes to you and says, I have concerns about the CEO's behavior. What should I do? I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a call to action immediately. The problem is that a lot of board members call, wait for the next board meeting, wait for rallying, wait for a democratic vote. In this particular case, there was a five to zero vote uh, to get a, a, a Charney and, out. And honestly, a lot of board members don't pay attention, do they? And, and a lot of board members are, uh, don't pay attention. But more importantly, most companies and most companies and, and second line people in the organization actually manage the board meeting so well that even the board oftentimes, oftentimes doesn't really know what's going and on. And maybe inside. the key here is more outside directors, less beholden to the CEO. You That's can't right. have the CEO hire the board and then the board be the CEO's boss. That's right. right. Uh, and that, of course, is particularly the case in, 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 in founder companies, founder-driven companies, so we have that problem. All right, Eric Joachimstaller, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Coming up, is it time to legalize insider trading? Our next guest says yes. You're watching Arise Exchange. News can definitely be improved when reflecting diversity. A lot of mainstream news, they, they don't dive into it. Who wants to hear about negativity all the time? They only show what you what they think people want to know and not what people really should know. World-based stories, that's what I enjoy the most. I think uh, diversity of news is important to the world so that everybody will be aware of their surroundings and what is happening today. Arise News, every culture, every angle. I believe that people are watching news less today, definitely. I think that more so people are going online to catch their news. We've um, numbed the human mind to murders and all these bad things. The content is uh, a constant loop of the same stuff. So there needs to be, you know, new content all the time. Arise news, every culture, every angle. Welcome back to Arise Exchange. Time now for our business ticker. Stories making headlines around the nation. It wasn't such a good day for IRS Commissioner John Koskinen. Faced tough questions on Capitol Hill. He testified before the House Ways and Means Committee. The commissioner acknowledged the IRS could not produce emails from some officials connected to a year-long investigation on whether the agency unfairly targeted conservative political groups. He went on to tell lawmakers he felt no need for the agency to apologize amid accusations of a cover-up, which led to this response from Congressman Paul Ryan. This is unbelievable. The apology that ought to be given is to the American taxpayer, not to a government agency that is abusing its power. I, I, I am sitting here listening to this testimony. I just, I don't believe it. That's your problem. Nobody believes you. The tax agency claims it lost an unknown number of emails in the investigation due to hard drive crashes from a year ago. 
There could be more potholes on the road. Federal funds for bridge and road repairs are about to run out. That's because lawmakers can't agree on how much money is needed and where to find it. The Federal Highway Trust Fund, which helps finance transportation projects and gets most of its money from the federal gas tax, has been spending more than it takes in now for more than a decade. Airline passengers are about to pay more for their airline tickets. The Transportation Security Administration is set to raise the fee to $5.60 each way. That's more than double for a round-trip flight. Trips with long stopovers will have bigger increases with each leg triggering a new fee. Congress approved the higher TSA fees as part of the December budget deal. The proposed changes will take effect next month. And some are calling them the holy grail of lyrics. Bob Dylan's original handwritten lyrics to Like a Rolling Stone are expected to set a new world record when they are auctioned at Sotheby's in New York next Tuesday. The lyrics from the 1965 song were scrolled on hotel stationery and filled with revisions and artistic doodles and are said to have influenced everyone from the Beatles to Bono. The lot is estimated to fetch $2 million. It sounds fair that insider trading should be illegal. After all, why should someone on the inside of a company get an advantage over you? But insider trading may be far more pervasive than we think, with law enforcement unable to do much about it. So some are arguing it's time to legalize insider trading, a radical idea or not that has some momentum. Lloyd Cohen is a professor at George Mason University School of Law and is the author of a law paper advocating for just that. Professor Cohen, thank you for joining us today. A very interesting topic. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so you know, the concept of insider trading is that it levels the playing field. Uh, but you argue that information wants to be free and should be free and that we should all just simply have access to it. Can you walk us through that a little bit? Yes. First of all, this is an area uh, that leads to a great deal of confusion. Uh, for one thing, the term insider trading is used to describe lots and lots of different activities, some of which are pernicious, uh, but most of which are not. And I'm really concerned with what we'll think of as core insider trading, meaning where officers and employees of a corporation trade on, uh, trade in the stock of their own corporation. And, and my argument is that this is a very benign, indeed, uh, productive activity. Um, we're not talking now, about we're, we're not talking about what the sort of the legal theory the SEC and the Justice Department often pursue, which is sort of theft of corporate information. Ah, no, no, no. We are talking we are talking about that. What I want to to, to read out of this is situations in which, for example, uh, federal judges or their clerks or com or congressional staff people. Um, trade in stock based on things that, that the government is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, th 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 that's a clear wrong and should be punished. Uh, I also um, want to leave out of this situations in which uh, officers and directors trade in um, products, uh, in land and so on, that they know their company is going to buy. That, th that's also a wrong and a breach of fiduciary duty. But as a... But, OK, go ahead. OK, but when an officer or, uh, or employee trades in the stock of his own company, uh, th that's what the SEC th initially thought of as core insider trading. And I'm s suggesting that's a good thing, not a bad thing, and should, should, should not be punished at all. And if you're a retail investor and you see the CEO trading on their stock, selling or buying, isn't that information that we'd want to know? Ah, y y yes, and in fact, um, uh, w you will get to know it. That is, they have to file uh, 16B filings when, when, they, when they, they trade. Now, if you mean, do we want to know the information that they had um, when they have it, yes, but there is simply no practical way in which the insider can, in, an, in a, um, a non-discriminatory fashion, pass this information on merely to his own stockholders. You, you, in your argument is that in, the insider trading laws do not level the playing field to begin with, which is impossible to do, and shouldn't. Oh, th th exactly right. First of all, this notion, it's a misleading metaphor, level playing field. Mm -hmm. The stock market is not a playing field. Uh, we may treat it as such, but you, you, or some people may treat it as such because they wish to, to, to gamble in, in, in the market. And they, they, you know, they somehow want to be equally placed with everyone else. Well, that's silly. You can't be. Uh, um, there, there will always be some traders who are more informed than other tra traders. 
That's the, na the nature of this. This is not a game of roulette. And don't you, do, you, we, do you think the government has sometimes gone too far where individual traders will do their own research and gain insider information because of research they do and then get prosecuted? Uh, y yes, that occurs as well. Not, and there's a distinction here between thinking of, of it as private information versus inside information. That, th that is, when you manage to acquire private information, you may not have acquired it in, even in any way that falls within uh, in recently narrow def definitions of inside information. But my point is a m m more significant one here, which is that insider information and trading on it is a good thing, not a bad thing. That is, the only way in which shareholders of a corporation can get a reward for, uh, for, the, for the inside information is by being able to pay officers and employees less money than they otherwise w would, would have to. That is, if, if you could get a job in a corporation at $400,000 $400, a year, and you could not trade on this inside information, or you could get another job at 300000 in which you could trade on inside information, it very well may be that the second job is more attractive than the first, okay. which means the shareholders have to pay you less money if you're, if you're allowed to trade on inside, inside information. Professor, Professor, we're out of time. I'd love to have you back on because it's a very complicated issue and there's a lot to talk about. Lloyd Cohen from George Mason University School of Law. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ahead, the ex-congressman who became unhinged over the Redskins' name is our favorite person of the day. You're watching Rise of Stage. One of the great things about Arise News, it is truly a multicultural global channel that is paying attention to communities of all different kinds, not just here in the United States, not just in Africa, but all around the world. As we're giving a voice to the people that don't traditionally have the kind of a voice that a mass media organization can have. You're getting here at Arise News that you're not going to find at the other networks is a unique perspective. And I think that's part of what Arise is here to do. Well, Arise is the only network that really covers uh, comprehensively the African diaspora. It gives people in other parts of the world of color a chance to know about people here in the United States, us to know about them, and the world to know about us. So it's kind of an educational experience for everybody involved. Getting to know people through stories, through personal stories, they really get a chance to know what people are actually all about, what communities are about. How are we different? But more importantly, what commonalities we all share. Pull up to the bar, time for liquid lunch, things that make us want to drink. There are many reasons people give that an individual criminal should not be in jail. Bad circumstances, rough childhood, etc. But 30-year-old Jeremy Meeks has created a new one, being too good-looking. Take a look at his mugshot, taken after he was arrested in California as part of a gun sting. Well, this mugshot quickly went viral with his good looks and tattoos spread all over the Internet. In fact, people with way too much time on their hands began photoshopping it, making him into a model for clothing companies. That is photoshopped. It is not from Calvin Klein. Proving that some women like their men both good looking and a little bad. The mugshot got more than 6,000 comments in just a few hours with some offering to be his prison wife. As for Meeks, he claims he has cleaned up his life and that he's no longer a kingpin. He remains in jail on gun charges. And that takes us to our favorite person of the day when we pick one person who grabbed our attention and not for the right reasons. Today, it is former Republican Congressman Joe Walsh, remember him, who tried to make a point about racial slurs by repeatedly using racial slurs on his radio show. Walsh claims he was trying to make a point about the name Washington Redskins by claiming he can say, quote, Redskins, but could not say the N-word on the radio. So over and over again, he said the N-word during his radio show on a Chicago station. Over and over, the station cut out the word his show is conducted on time delay. Then, the general manager of the station walked in in the middle of the show and told Walsh he would not be allowed back. Since that wasn't enough, Walsh took to Twitter to complain. Quote, if the Redskins, if the Redskins is just like the N-word, why can't I say Redskins on air without being dumped out into a commercial? And found out if I said Redskin or Cracker or Redneck Bible Thumper, I could stay on. Walsh's point if he had one, was clearly lost in a sensationalistic and hyperbolic attempt at making one. Walsh is the same guy, by the way, who called President Obama a liar during a State of the Union address. So civil debate, 
isn't up his alley. Joe Walsh is our favorite person of the day. Coming up, it's a dog world. Hi, Riley. Our corner office when a rise exchange returns. And it is Friday, so that means it's five o'clock somewhere. We'll take Riley out for a drink. Stay with us. I think news does make people put things in black and white terms just so that they have a dividing line between what their viewers like and dislike. When they like see a person of color, they either think that they're not going to do anything, they're either on drugs or they got pregnant at an early age. And I just want to say that that's not true. It tends to reflect more the interests of the upper income people and the upper income interests. Arise News, every culture, every angle. In tonight's corner office, man and dog. Americans spend $58 billion a year on their pets, according to the American Pet Association. And today is, get this, National Take Your Dog to Work Day. Joining us now is dog trainer Mark Elias, owner of Pooch Pals, who also calls himself a canine executive officer. He is here with us because his dog, Riley, he brought Riley to work with him hey, today. Hey, Riley girl. Hey, Andrew. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. How did uh, National Dog Day, Take Your Dog to Work Day, come into being? Was it a bunch of people who didn't have kids and therefore couldn't take their kids to work? The uh, Pet Sitter International Group, they created this opportunity to embrace uh, people that work in offices that want to, you know, hang with their furry kids. And now I, I take it it's a little bit better because are you seeing that, uh, that our animal companions, if you will, are better trained and better behaved? Most of the time they are, Andrew, and I get called in generally after the fact when there's an issue. When they've gone off the reservation Yeah, when they've a gone bit. off the reservation, <laughs> then they call okay, me Okay, so in. to that extent, you buy a puppy, mm -hmm. when should you start the, the training process? It's a really, so. really great question. So generally, when you have a puppy, you want to actually start the socialization and training process as early as six to seven weeks. Often, vets might recommend that that is maybe a little bit too early, but on the training side with behavior and psychology, we want these dogs socialized and trained as early as possible. Are these smarter dogs easier to train or because they're smart, they're saying, you know, the heck with you, I'm just going to do what I want? Or are the dumber dogs harder to train because they're dumb? That's... And you I know, hate to say the dogs, some dogs are dumb. Well, no, that's, they... That's, I've had a bunch of them. Yeah, <laughs> I know you told me that earlier, you had a bunch of dogs. Um, so dogs are either motivated or they're unmotivated. It's really about finding out what is it that really motivates your dog. And so for the dogs that aren't motivated, we have strategies to kick them into overdrive. Are you surprised over the years, you've been doing this for quite a few years now, about how much Americans are spending on their animals. I mean, there, there's a phrase here in New York that dogs are the new kids, which is a, a somewhat oh, terrible yes. thing to say, but it's really true. Absolutely. You know, the pet care community, it's just people spend so much money on their dogs. They're bound to spend money on their pets before they are their own On their cells. children. Yeah, it's both. It's, they're going to spend money on their pets and their kids before they spend it on themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know that from having a dog. It's just like one of those impulse things. You want to take care of your furry child. And that's where we come in to provide pet care and dog training. How did you start in the business and what kind of competition are you facing these days? Because this has got to be a competitive industry. It is. And, you know, I started in the field roughly about five years ago. I was in corporate America making great money and I wasn't happy. I wanted what were you to, doing in corporate America? I was in marketing okay. and um, This and has got to be a lot more fun. Oh, are you kidding me? I'm Let's get Riley up. Does Riley do things? Riley girl. Come on, baby girl. You want to play with me? So when I started in the pet care field, what I realized was... By the way, I don't was, know if you can see Riley's uh, bow tie. Oh, her bow tie. Riley, Riley is well-dressed. Yes, of Riley course. We're matching, Andrew. <laughs> We're matching. Um, so having been in the field... You talk to each other in the morning before you dress. Oh, of course. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is a competitive field, and you know what makes Pooch Pals unique is that all of our services include positive reinforcement training. So that's dog walking, overnight pet sitting, and boarding. Yeah, do you believe in positive reinforcement or tough love with the animals? Because I love that question. So, the, Andrew, there's no right way to train your dog, period. And that's how I get people's listening is, is we train our dogs through just one way, and that's positive reinforcement, shaping behavior through either adding a positive value or removing it. 
and I've never met a case that I haven't been able to successfully train. Um, how do you therefore maintain the ongoing training with an animal? Is this something like you know going to the gym that people need to be bringing their animal back to you all the time? It is. It's uh, it's got to be consistent. And you know, one of the things that our clients do is they'll hire us for private training and then hire us for Monday through Friday dog walking, where our staff will then reinforce the concepts which we've taught them. It's in interesting their you say dog walking, we're running out of time. Yeah. They're, they really are social animals and yeah. they shouldn't be left alone during the day if not yeah. possible. It's Get right. them a friend, a cat, or some other dog totally. or put them with a dog trainer. Absolutely. They need play dates, they need socialization, it's good for their head. Good for their body. It's amazing how doggy spas have sort of sprung up as well. Oh, it's, it's unbelievable how in the pet care field, more and more premium services are cropping up from spas to foods to various services. We plan to, we continue to actually be that in the pet care space. Mark Elias, summer starts this weekend. Take your pooch out for a walk. I'm Andrew Schmertz. Thanks for watching Arise Exchange. Have a nice weekend.